uh, is a random variable and we would like to understand its statistics and in particular what happens in, uh, in the large end limit. So the first thing that I, I showed you and I think that that's really one, one of the key points is that the, this cumulative distribution uh, is just related to the survival probability of a random walk. So I will remind you that the survival probability is the following. So here is a picture of what it is. Uh, you take a random walk that starts at, uh, at Y, at initial time, and then performs this random jump type of dynamics. And you ask what's the probability that it stays positive up to time N, up to step N. Okay? So it doesn't have the right, it cannot cross zero. So these two quantities are related via a simple transformation, uh, which I showed you yesterday. And uh, furthermore, uh, we had seen on a previous lecture that the survival probability satisfies a uh, backward uh, equation, basically a kind of Kolmogorov equation. And eventually, this, uh, this uh, integral, which is quite involved uh, equation, because it's an integral equation for which uh, very few tools exist, but it turns out that for this specific case, it's possible actually to solve it, and this is solved via this uh, so-called polaxx pizza formula, which I gave to you, uh, which was a bit complicated, but still, I mean, which contains essentially all the information that we need. And from it, uh, we derived two uh, interesting and important results. The first one is, I think, extremely important. Uh, and this is called, uh, this is known under the name of Spar Andersen theorem, uh, which gives, uh, gives you the survival probability uh, when you start exactly at zero, which is indeed possible for a random walk. And uh, basically, from the Polax X pizza formula, you obtain, uh, well, one obtains, sorry, uh, this generating function. And from it, uh, we can invert this, uh, this, this relation and obtain Q naught of n in terms of this. Uh, uh, combinatorial factor. So that's quite remarkable because, again, it does not depend on anything, uh, meaning that uh, you see that the distribution of eta does not enter this, uh, this expression, provided, of course, so this holds, indeed, uh, for P of eta, uh, continuous and symmetric, but still, I mean, it's, it really covers a wide range of, uh, of situations. There are actually, I mean, extensions of it to the case where P of eta is not symmetric, for instance, if it's centered around a finite value, if you have a linear drift, for instance, there are some extensions of it. Um, if you are interested, I could give you some reference on that, but uh, already this is, is quite nice. Probably at this stage, it's already important also to mention that you see, I mean, this, this thing is really universal. Now, of course, it's universal only if you start exactly at zero, and if you start to at a different place, meaning if not zero, but say y, of course you lose completely the, the universality. That means that uh, if I start now from y, and if I ask what is the, this survival probability, it will of course depend uh, quite strongly on the, the jump distribution. And this was clearly stated uh, in the polax x pizza formula, where you had on the right-hand side, you had really the explicit Fourier transform of the jump distribution that enters. So now, uh, so that's, that's a very nice, uh, very nice uh, um, result, and we will see many applications of it, actually. Uh, today we will see one, and later on, uh, when we will study the record statistics of these random walks in the last two lectures, uh, you will see that this, this plays really a crucial role. So that was the first thing, and the only thing, the other thing that, that, that I showed you is how to obtain a result for uh, the first moment of the maximum. And uh, I showed you that from the polax x pizza formula, uh, one can write explicitly the generating function of this average value. So in principle, if I know this guy, in principle, I can compute mn simply by using uh, Cauchy's formula. Uh, this might be a bit involved. Uh, and also here it, it is involved because I have not written it uh, because, uh, because it's a bit cumbersome, but phi is a relatively complicated formula. But nevertheless, we have something, we have something explicit. So I will not uh, do the full uh, analysis of this, uh, of how you uh, now extract m of n from that formula, because it's a little bit cumbersome and complicated. I mean, it, needs, it requires a little bit of, uh, okay, you need to be quite comfortable with, uh, 
analysis. But nevertheless, I just want to give you at least the, the, the idea of how, I mean, what, how, how you should react uh, when you have such a result um, and, and what can you extract from it. So we're not enter into the details, but simply uh, say uh, a few general things on how to extract the large end behavior of MN once you know this, this right-hand side. Okay, so this right-hand side is known explicitly. It's some function. It's a bit complicated, but it's explicit, right? You have an integral representation of it. And now the question that you ask is, uh, okay, extracting it uh, from any N is probably complicated, but what you would like to, uh, the, the question that you would like to, to answer is uh, the behavior of uh, MN for large N. Okay, so again, I mean, uh, if, you, if you had, I mean, why, why are, you, are we interested in that? I mean, it's clear that uh, you see, I mean, if I suppose that I have a random walk here where with Gaussian, suppose that these eta n's are Gaussians, uh, then we know that typically, uh, the, if, if they were, suppose that these this xn's were completely independent, then we know that uh, if they, if at least these xn's, suppose that they are Gaussians, the maximum would go quite slowly with n, and it should go like square root of log n, typically, if you have Gaussians, OK? Now, the question is, what, what are the effects of correlations uh, on the growth of this, uh, of this, of this quantity? OK, so that, that's a quite natural question, and that's really a very simple way to characterize the effects of correlations uh, compared to the IAD case. So how should I do that? So what I want to understand, OK, so it's the behavior of, of, of mn for large n. So. So, in general, uh, when you have to, uh, so that's that's really the, the something that, uh, that 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 one needs to know. Uh, essentially, one, when you have such a, such a formula here, when you know the generating function of an of, of a series like that, then if you want to know the large end behavior of this, you need to understand how this series here behaves when s goes to one. Okay, so typically, I mean, in most of the uh, of, of the cases, uh, the radius of convergence of this of this series is is, is finite, and uh, typically it's one. Uh, and what you want to understand uh, is basically uh, how this. Uh, so let me call it uh, say this function. So that's the generating function of, of, of what what I what I wrote here. And the idea is that uh, the behavior. Uh, so basically, that the behavior of mn uh, for large n, and I will be more precise in a minute, but is controlled by the behavior of this quantity when s goes to 1. Okay, so in other words, uh, typically what will happen is that, again, uh, mn, roughly speaking, uh, in most of these cases here, mn will, be, uh, will have a power law behavior when n is large. And as a consequence, what is happening is that you see, I mean, when s is larger than 1, this s to the n, I mean, diverges exponentially, and eventually the series is not converging. While on the other hand, if s is smaller than 1, then you see that this goes to 0 exponentially with n, and in that case, the series is well defined. So in most of the cases that, that one has to deal with, I'm not saying that I'm covering all the possible cases in the universe, but in most of the cases that we have to deal with, mn grows typically uh, like a power law. And that means that the radius of convergence of this series is 1. And if you want to understand how, so that means that m tilde of s will be diverging when s goes to 1. And the way it diverges is controlled by the large end behavior of mn. Okay, it's a theorem of analysis. It's essentially a one of the Tauberian theorem, if you want. Uh, and in particular, uh, let's be, uh, let, let me be a little bit uh, more, uh, more precise, uh, and because that's the way we will use this, this theorem here. Uh, so in particular, uh, if m tilde of s is diverging, say, as a power law, so let's write it in this way. 
is beta strictly positive when s goes to 1, and by it has to be smaller than 1, of course, such, such, such that this, this series uh, is, is converging. Then, in this case, what you get, what you will get, is that m of, sorry, is that this moment here, right, this moment here will behave like n to the power beta minus 1, when n is large, when n goes to infinity. And the prefactor here is just given by a divided by gamma of beta. OK? So that's the, uh, so what is gamma uh, of beta? This is just this integral, so that's just integral dx, x to the power beta minus 1, exponential minus x. Okay, that's just a reminder here. And in particular, you all know, I guess, that gamma n plus 1, when n is an integer, is just factorial n. Okay, so that's a very nice, uh, very nice uh, property. Okay, so again, you see that uh, for s equal 1 strictly, this series will be diverging, obviously. And the way it diverges is controlled by this parameter here, by the exponent there. And eventually, so that means that you can do the, the reversed way, so, so, somehow it's probably easier to understand. But you can easily see that if you have a behavior like that, inserted this way, then it's fairly simple to see that it will have this, this behavior when as goes to one. Okay, it's, it requires some work, and I would suggest here to take it as a, a theorem. Uh, it's extremely useful. It will be useful here, and it, in the following we will use it quite, 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 quite frequently. Okay? I guess you have already seen this kind of theorem of these results. This is a standard result in analysis, which is very useful here. So that means that if you want to understand uh, the behavior of mn, then I need to analyze this right-hand side here in the limit when s goes to 1. Okay. Now, I have not written here, but I have not written it here, but if you remember, the, the formula for this phi was a little bit complicated. So this requires a little, a little bit of analysis to really extract uh, the behavior of this quantity when s goes to 1. But that's doable. Uh, and let me just, you, give, let me just give you the, the result. And we'll see uh, what uh, okay. We'll see, we'll, we'll see what, what happens. Okay, is that is that okay? So I just want to want you to buy this, okay? And then uh, we will apply that many times. I mean, many times. Here we will apply it a little bit, and later on we will apply it also quite quite a few. I mean, it's extremely useful, and it's something that is. I think it's useful to have seen it once in his life, uh, at least when you, when you do theoretical physics. So here, uh, what one, one can show that uh, this, this quantity here, so let's consider the case, OK, I will just discuss the case where sigma is finite. OK, so now I, I need to, uh, to distinguish between levy walks and, uh, and standard random walks, so I suppose that the jump distribution, so that means that I, I will suppose that the, the, the second moment of the jump distribution uh, is well defined. Okay, so that means that the random mox converges to, uh, as I discussed it yesterday or the day before, sorry, the random mox uh, will converge to Brownian motion. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a, it's not heavy tail. So I have just standard random mox. And in that case, so there is a sigma. Let me define sigma squared this way. So what you can show there in this, in this, uh, in this case is that you can actually extract uh, the behavior uh, of, of, this, of, this, uh, of this term. And one can show that, uh, one can show what? Well, one can show that basically this generating function behaves as s goes to 1, behaves as uh, sigma divided by square root of 2, 
divided by 1 minus s to the power 3 by 2. Okay, so that's the result of the analysis. I had, yeah, initially I thought that I would present you this, this computation. I mean, for those of you who want to see it, we, I, could, I could show you how it works. So then you see that I can apply this nice theorem and immediately get that mn will have this behavior here. So if you now, so beta is 3 by, is three by 2 here, 3 half. So that means that the exponent here will be 3 half minus 1. That means half, OK? So let's do it. So that means that mn for large n, so again, I have beta. So I will have, so a here is just sigma divided by square root of 2. Then I will get gamma. Uh, gamma uh, 3 by 2, um, and then uh, I will indeed get, yeah, that's correct, n to the power uh, 3 half minus 1, which is just half. Okay? Now, gamma 3 by 2 is just square root of pi divided by 2. Yeah, you see, I mean, you have 3 by 2. Basically, these are related to some Gaussian integrals. That's why you get this, uh, this square root of pi. So that's the result. So again, I mean, this, this results from this analysis. And basically, this results from that theorem. Okay? So eventually, uh, you, get, you get this formula. Okay, so let's get uh, the, the, the coefficient properly. So this is just now uh, sigma. So I just have sigma square root of 2 and over pi. So let's write it this way. Okay, so that's our result when n is large. So it's actually quite interesting because you see that now instead of having something that goes like square root of log n, which you would have for a Gaussian collection of Gaussian random variables, okay, then what you get is something that goes much, much faster and it goes actually like square root of n. Okay, so that's a clear signature. This square root of n here is a very clear signature of the um, of the of correlations which we would not get of course uh, for the IID case uh, in fact if you are uh, even uh, you can even show you can even compute the, the correction here the correction is of order one this is something that you can compute explicitly um, there is a nice paper by my colleagues from Orsay, uh, Alain Conté and Satya Majumdar, who did this very nice computation here. Um, but that's something that, uh, that, that, can be, that can be done using this, this formula. Okay, so that's for the case of, uh, of sigma, sigma square, finite. Okay, now you can repeat the same, although the analysis is even more complicated. But uh, you can repeat the same analysis uh, uh, in the case of uh, Levy flights. Okay, so yes, yes, sure. The framework we are in right now is that the n is like the discrete time, right? Yes. That's true. Okay, so it's the same time. And why the square root of n is the same time? Yeah, okay. Okay, I was a little bit fast. Uh, okay, so I was just, uh, so why, why do I say this? <clears throat> the reason why I say this is that, uh, uh, so it's just a remark. Okay, let's consider the case, uh, which is discrete time. And suppose that this uh, eta ends, let's consider this case. Uh, suppose that these are IID Gaussians. Okay. So if there were Gaussians, uh, basically, um, then you would say, okay. I mean, if I look at uh, this extends, basically would be uh, would be IID random variables. There would be also Gaussians. Okay. And if I look at the collection of IID random variables, which are Gaussians, and if they are n of them, 
then typically the maximum should go like square root of log n. Okay? Now here what you see is that the situation is quite different and it goes much faster. It actually goes like square root of n. So that, that's what I meant. Okay? So that's what, uh, okay, that's, that, that, that's, what, that's what I meant, okay? Yeah, yeah, so now, we, okay, so, so what I'm saying is that if you suppose that they are not correlated, if you just look at this x size as independent random variables, okay, they are just Gaussians, okay, and typically they will have, uh, if you look at the maximum, we know that they are correlated, okay, but suppose that you have Gaussians and forget about the correlations, then uh, the, 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 the growth of the maximum would be typically like square root of log n, and here what you get is something much faster instead. If you include the correlations, then things are quite different. Yeah, in this case, so the point is that here you see, I mean, it's even more universal than, than, the, than anything that we encountered in, in IID case, because here it does not depend on the, on the parent distribution of the, of, of the eta ends, right? So if they are exponentials, Gaussians, uh, uniformly distributed, uh, you will get this result. Now, it turns out that uh, the reason why it is universal is something relatively easy to understand. Uh, it's just that uh, in all the, for all these random walks with a finite sigma, we know that they will converge to Brownian motion. And what you can show. That's true. But nevertheless, we will see this in a minute. So basically, for Brownian motion, uh, n will be a t here. But this result here, you can actually get it from the Brownian motion limit. Okay, that means that if you look at, I will probably comment on this a bit later, this leading behavior here in square root of n, including the prefactor here, is actually given by the Brownian motion. Right, exactly. So the scale that we get, this square root of n, pick, this square root of n that pops up here, is actually the square root of n of the diffusion. Yeah. Absolutely. I will maybe, I, I, I want to discuss the Brownian motion limit, so I hope it will be uh, a bit, uh, okay. This, this will clarify a little bit this. Yes? Yeah, okay, so <laughs> that's, uh, Okay, that's a good question. So here, uh, if, if, I, if, if I need to, uh, okay, I will, I will, I will, we will see that because in a minute I will, I will look at the full distribution. So in this case, actually, so if, if I have in mind this AN and BNs that I had in the IID case, so in this case, actually, AN is zero and BN is square root of N. I will, I will, I will, I will see, we will see that maybe in a minute. That's, that, that's a good point indeed. I, will just, I just want to, to give you the result uh, for the case of, of Levy flights, because it might be interesting or important in some applications. So suppose that now I have a P of eta, uh, which is like that, with alpha strictly positive. And in fact, I want to, take, I want to talk about the, the, the first moment, so I need, okay. I need to, to, to restrict my, myself to the case where alpha is in between one and two, because if you go to uh, smaller values of alpha, in fact, the first moment of mn is not even defined. But in that case, it is. Uh, and what you find uh, is that, uh, okay, uh, this, is, uh, this is what, okay, there is some constant here, some universal constant here, alpha uh, over phi. Gamma over one minus alpha. So what is this a here? Uh, this is something that I already uh, introduced before. But if I look at the so in that case, if I look at the uh, the small k behavior of the Fourier transform, okay, we, we know that's that's the central object. Then it will behave like. Okay, I already, already commented on that when I, okay, so this A, which is here, eventually will depend on C, 
and this is basically related to that. Okay. So you need to, to, to plug this, the full distribution for P of eta, look at the small k behavior, it will have this behavior like this, the A you need to read that, and this is the A that you find here. Uh, no, no, it's uh, because I uh, am a bit uh, sloppy. Okay, thank you, sorry. Okay, so MN actually, you see, again, uh, so it goes faster than square root of N. And you see also that this is, it has the same scale as the Levy flights, right? We know that if I have a Levy, Levy random walk of N steps, the typical scaling is N to the power 1 over alpha, and that's this guy again. Okay? Is that clear? Please stop me if it's not. Huh? Yeah, exactly. So in both cases, this is true, right? I mean, for, for, for the diffusion, uh, we know that the typical scaling of, the, of Xn will be over the square root of n. And here it will be n to the power 1 over alpha, and indeed, the maximum has the same scaling as, as the other ones, precisely. Which is not completely trivial in principle. So now I want to, uh, to discuss maybe a little bit the, the, to look at the full distribution, if you want, of, the, of MN. Okay, so and, and make some contact with, with your question, uh, which is what are these ANs and BNs here. Okay, so let's go to the full distribution, of course, uh, I don't want to get it direct. I mean, for, you can get this actually from the from the Polak Zek Spitzer formula, but this this is really a very hard work, uh, and I will not even uh, quote the result. But uh, what I want to to discuss for you here uh, is essentially the Brownian limit because there are things. Uh, okay. So it's the full distribution of M N when n is large. So what happens is that uh, if you look at uh, this quantity here, again, uh, we have seen already many times that it has this typical shape, right? If I plot it as a function of y, so the typical value here, so that's, that's what I mean here, is that the typical value there, so it's something like this, it goes like that when n is very large. And the way, the point at which this jump arises, which is the typical value, uh, is actually mn. OK, so if you want mn here, we really plays the role of uh, the typical value of the maximum. And uh, in fact, uh, we know that, uh, OK, let's, I will focus on the case where sigma is, uh, sigma is finite, because Okay, so I don't, I will not discuss the case of Levy flights, which is interesting, but also more involved. So this we have seen, now that this is just, okay, it's not anymore on the blackboard, but uh, this is of that form sigma square root of n. There is some prefactor square root of 2 pi, square root of 2 over pi if you want, but uh, okay. let me include it, otherwise you will be a bit confused. Now, so that actually suggests that this Q of Yn in the large n limit, uh, so this scaling here, so one sees that the typical scale is of order square root of n, and this suggests, I'm not saying that it shows it, but this suggests that, uh, and somehow we have already seen it, but uh, this suggests that this Q of Yn takes a scaling form, uh, which is of that form, okay? So that will be something of that form. So again, the same argument that I did last time for the survival probability. So Q is a probability, so it has dimension 1. And the natural scaling variable you see, I mean, is the scale square root of n. Okay. So you see that that's, so that's the cumulative distribution. Okay. So uh, this, this, this indeed has this form. Okay. So that tells you that, in other words, uh, what, what, what I'm uh, sort of saying uh, here um, is that um, the typical scale of the, that controls all the, flu, the, the fluctuations of the maximum is of the order of square root of n. Okay, so that's the typical fluctuations of your maximum. They will be of order of square root of n. And it's, 
centered around zero, so there is no a n here if you want. So if you want to come back to the IID case, this really amounts to have a n equal to zero uh, and b n equal to square root of n. Okay, because I'm saying that corresponds to if I want to make some contact uh, and b n equal square root of n. Okay, so I, I don't need there will not be a shift here. F you will see is a very simple function in fact. So what I said before uh, is that uh, in this limit, in the Langen limit, uh, one can actually directly, okay, of course, one way to obtain this F here is to go to the polax Spitzer formula, which you can do. Another way to do that is to observe that in the, in the Langen limit, and when you look at the scale of order square root of n, well, the fluctuations of the random walk are governed by the Brownian motion, okay? So that means that this function here, f, will be given by the Brownian motion limit, okay? So that means that this f of y over square root of n, uh, it's okay. Uh, this, of course, I should maybe, I can be a little bit more precise if you want. Uh, this, of course, holds uh, in the limit when y is, larger than one, uh, n is larger than one, and you look at y over square root of n fixed, okay? Okay, so that's the, the, that's the scaling limit, right? So let me, okay, let, let me write it explicitly because it's important. The scaling limit is really y large, n large, and you keep y divided by square root of n fixed. And you know that if you do that, uh, all these observables of the random walk will be described by the Brownian motion, okay? So that means that this f function here, f of z, is given by the Brownian limit. And the Brownian limit, you remember, we have already uh, studied it because I solved uh, the equation for the survival probability directly in the Brownian uh, motion limit and I found this error function, okay? So that tells you that this f of z is nothing else but uh, an error function. So in other words, uh, you can write directly, uh, you can pick up directly the result that we had last time, right? So that's this error function f of y uh, divided by square root of 2n. <clears throat> Remember that? Okay, so what I know is that y over divided by square root, well, y divided by sigma square root of n will converge to the Brownian motion, and then that's, that's immediately what I get, okay? I can redo all the things that we did last time, but I think it's not completely uh, useful. But is that clear? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm saying is that uh, I am looking, I want to understand what is happening uh, to this random walk when there is a large number of steps. Now what I know is that uh, in that limit when n is large, we know that the, this random walk will converge uh, to Brownian motion, and it actually converges to Brownian motion if you rescale, of course, the coordinates by square root of n. So in other words, that means that in this kind of function, you need to renormalize, if you want, all your uh, distances by square root of n to get something which is well-defined and has a good large n limit and eventually uh, is converging to the, to, the Brownian motion, uh, to the Brownian motion results. Do you understand? So in other words, it's a bit like, 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 with, like the, the remark that I was making last time when I did the, the, the IID case. Somehow, if you take this, this formula here, and if you blindly take the limit n goes to infinity, you will not uh, obtain anything really relevant except some uh, theta function. If you want to do something uh, more precise, what you need to do is really to, 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 do, this, to do this rescaling. Somehow, introduce a non-trivial bn, if you want. Now, we know what this bn is because we know that there is convergence to this Brownian limit, okay? So, 
So in particular, if I had uh, a Levy flight, instead of having square root of n here, I would expect something like n to the power 1 over alpha. Okay. Yeah. You mean for uh, for Bn? Yes. Well, no, actually, because the okay, so that's the uh, <coughs> yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's that's the that's the final answer, and in particular, uh, so that's the, the 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 CDF. Then we can get the 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 PDF of the maximum. It's better somehow. Uh, the PDF is just uh, dq dy, and dq dy is just an error function. Okay. It's just a, a Gaussian. Okay, so that's uh, just this result here. Phi sigma square n exponential of minus y square divided by two sigma square n. Now here one has to take care of one thing is that this is only positive. Okay, the maximum is necessarily positive. So yeah, y has to be positive. Yes. And uh, is there any sign of correlation in this uh, kind of formula? Well, I mean, yeah, well, the sign is that, uh, indeed, that the, 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 the limiting distribution that you have is not a gamble. Oh, yeah. It's not a gamble, it's not, uh, not fraîché, but that's a good point. Uh, this, this limiting distribution, okay, it's, it's a bit trivial, it's a Gaussian, but it's a half Gaussian. Why has to be positive? The reason for that is that uh, it has to be positive because the random walk, you remember, starts at zero here. And since it starts at zero, the maximum cannot be smaller than zero. Okay. So y has to be positive. And indeed, this is a half Gaussian. So, and that, that's, that's a good point. Indeed, this distribution, although being a Gaussian, uh, it's, not, it's not really uh, trivial or it's not a simple fact uh, to observe it here because we are looking at extreme statistics and one would na naively expect to, to see either the Gamble or the Frechet or Weibull. And uh, the answer is that we observe something quite different. Okay. So again, this uh, this R, this uh, error function here. Uh, so that's a good point indeed. Which is well, you mean you say because it's a Gaussian? Yeah, I mean every kind of. That's true. So so the the the, the, the indeed the, the the universality is also very. I mean is is also extremely large here. Yes. So it's a new, it's another universality class. Uh, for it's an important universality class, I should say. Uh, so it's different from uh, IID universality class, right? Uh, which are again uh, Gamble, uh, Frechet. Uh, or Vibu. Okay, this is not none of these one. And that's, that's obviously something different. Now, maybe a comment on that. I said that this result here actually comes from the, the Brownian limit. So uh, what's something that you can check, I leave you as a check. Uh, this result here is precisely the result of, the, uh, of the, the Brownian limit. So in other words, if you compute, uh, okay, maybe it's just as a remark here. So I obtained this formula here before, or at least I showed you that I can obtain it via this polax Spitzer formula. Now, in fact, you can also, once you have done this analysis, you can do it, you can get it immediately by computing the mean value of this, uh, of this, uh, of this random variable. Here. Okay, so once you have this limit here, essentially, uh, you can just get, okay, let's, let me write it here. The mn that I obtained here, you can just obtain it this way from this integral, dy, y, dq, dy. So again, uh, this is just the, the, the mean value of, of, of the Brownian. Uh, can you read it? So in other words, I worked a lot with this Polaksek, I mean, to get a result that I could have obtained in, in two lines. But of course, I mean, there are some good reasons for that. Uh, in some cases, you would like to need uh, to have uh, so I mentioned that in some cases, it's very important to get the, the subleading corrections. For instance, there are many problems. And there is a very nice problem uh, 
uh, in computer science, uh, which has to deal with the, the analysis of some algorithm, uh, where it's turned out to be uh, quite important to get this, uh, uh, this constant here. Uh, there is a famous work by Flajolet. Uh, so that's, and then for, for this case, of course, you need really to, uh, to have this machinery and not simply the, 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 Brownian, the Brownian limit. But nevertheless, uh, it's good to know the Brownian result. Uh, it's already quite useful. And uh, in many cases, this is even a good approximation to, to the random walk limit. So we, one has an explicit expression for Brownian uh, uh, in the Brownian limit. Now, if you take Levy flights, there is no so simple expression. Uh, instead, the, the, one has some rather complicated integral representation of the distribution of the maximum. But still, I mean, it's fairly explicit in things that you can get that you can get with the with this Polax X pizza and, and extensions of it. OK, so uh, I want to leave this. Uh, yeah, are, are there questions? OK, so I want to, to just to, 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 to have a last, uh, last remark uh, or last application somehow of what we have been doing um, to compute another quantity which is related to, uh, to the extreme statistics. So up to now, I was looking at the value of the maximum. Now, if you look at the, 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 the process uh, of, as, of Brownian motion, a, very, a quite natural quantity is to ask when does this maximum happen. Okay, so if you look at your uh, random walk uh, on, a, uh, say, up to step n, so you start at 0, and you will have these kind of things. And you would like to know where when this, this maximum happened. OK, so that, that's, that's the question that you want to ask here. So that's the time. The time at which the maximum is reached. So I want to show you this because It looks like a bit like a complicated question. Of course, it's quite important. I mean, right? I mean, if you have in mind that you are looking at some, uh, I don't know, if you think that it's the, the price of some uh, assets or whatever, uh, and it's of, of some options, uh, it would be quite important to know at which time this 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 happens. Yeah. The mean value, well, it's like square root of n. So the maximum goes like square root of n. So n is the number of steps. OK, so we have seen that mn goes like square root of n. Is that fine? So it depends on time somehow, right? When n is large, it, it, it gets larger. And now you ask, OK, given that, that I have this, uh, I look at this random walk on, 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 the, on the interval 0, n, and I want to know when it happens, at which time steps does it happen? Is, is, is that clear? Does it answer your question? So, yeah, again, this, this, this is obviously a quite, quite important quantity. Um, now, again, yeah, maybe a remark. Uh, here I'm looking at the case where, again, uh, just to fix the notation, but uh, P of eta is, uh, is symmetric. That's one thing. But it's continuous. And since it is continuous, uh, there is no degeneracy, right? So that means that, the, as, I mean, with probability one, uh, this maximum is reached at a single point. Okay, so almost surely, one should say, almost surely the maximum is reached at a single point. Okay, so there are not two points which are which have the same values. Okay, simply p of eta is continuous. So now you want you want to uh, to, to to do this uh, to do this thing. So you want to compute the distribution of of of, of the time. Uh, which I will denote M if you want. So question is how do I, uh, uh, do, I do I obtain that? So the idea is to, uh, so you will do some uh, construction that, that is very useful when you look at this, uh, this uh, random walks. You just separate it on two sides. 
the first side which is before the, the maximum and the other one which is after the maximum. Okay, so let's just look at these two parts. Okay, so I just divide these uh, two independent parts. Okay, uh, so I just divide it uh, in these two two segments. Okay, so I have basically here the the first zero m and m n minus one. Okay, so these two segments, of course, because the the the, the process is Markovian, uh, these two segments here are just independent. Uh, why do I say m n, n minus 1 is probably not correct. It's n, yes, sure. And m n. Okay. And then, so basically, uh, I, will, I want to write the, the, the probability. So the, this is the PDF of, 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 so I want to compute this P of m n, okay? So that's the PDF, that's the probability. So it's a, it's a true probability because m is discrete here. Okay, so m is a discrete random variable. So it's the probability uh, that the max is reached at m. Okay. So I will again write the things in this way. So to have the maximum in m, so basically I need first to propagate from, say, 0 to m, reaching the value mn, but staying below this line. OK, so on this part here, you see, I mean, I stick to, I need to uh, just, because this guy is a maximum, so all the points have to stay below this value mn here. OK, so I have a first part here, and this guy can be anything. So you see, I mean, you can just view this part here which is, of course, independent of this guy. Well, you can do, again, what we did before, right? So the, the probability of this path here is the same as, so let me reverse the thing. So if I just take this, this, uh, this part here, I will first do one thing, which is that uh, you can also write it in this way, right? So I just move the origin here. So I have this point here. And then I'm doing something like this. And then, so I'm doing two things, okay? I'm changing the, 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 the direction of the y-axis and also of the x-axis, okay? So that gives something like that, okay? So you are just reversing this and reversing this one. Is that fine? Now, this will say mn is the value, so let's call it the value of the maximum. So that's basically, so the probability to arrive here and touch this point for the first time, arriving at y, is basically the same as starting from 0, staying positive, and arriving at y. Okay, we have done this already, this, this kind of manipulation. Okay. Now, what is nice is that when you do this, of course, the value of y can be anything, okay, because I'm looking at the value of, of m, but the, the value itself of the maximum can be anything. So I will eventually integrate over all the possible values of y. And when you integrate over the values of y, well, you see that this, the probability of this part here is nothing else but the survival probability starting at 0. Okay. So the, the, the weight of this path here, this first part, is just q of 0 m. OK? Survival probability. Starting at 0. OK, so I just did this very simple uh, manipulation. Reversed the x and reverse time, which I have the right to do here because the, 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 the random walk is completely symmetric regarding these two transformations. So this is one, one piece here, one piece. So I have Q, so this is the first part. And now I have to investigate the weight of this other path here. But the weight of this other path is also quite simple, right? Because you see here on this, on this part, again, so I have a random walk of n minus m time steps. 
okay? I have n minus m times steps here. I start at this point, and I should never recross it during the n minus m, simply because this guy is the maximum, okay? So there cannot be any other points higher than this one on that side. So that means that on that part, I start, so I can again do the uh, similar transformation as I did, exactly the same, so I, well, the same. I just need to, in this case, uh, just to uh, basically shift the origin at that point and make a reverse, reverse space. And that will again be the survival probability starting from zero, but now with n minus m time steps. Is that okay? So that means that the, the probability of the second part is just q of zero times n minus n. Do you like it? Yes. It's not starting at one. So it's starting at zero. Right? Because you, you arrive here. So you, you reach at this point. Uh, so in M, you really need to touch this point. And is that fine? Sorry? Yeah, so okay, why, yeah, why was this point here? Okay, so you start, why is the value of the maximum? Suppose that mn is equal to y is the maximum, and I start at zero. So if I look at this part here, what I'm doing is that I first, I shift the origin, so the origin now is in y, so that means that this guy would be in minus y. If it's zero, then it would be minus y. Then I reversed the y axis, Yeah, OK, I see. So now what, what I said is that, in fact, you have to integrate over all the possible values of y. Because you can reach the maximum at some value y, but actually y can be anything. So you have to integrate over all these possible values. Is that OK? So the maximum, of course, so here I, I, I just draw a specific configuration where the maximum is y and is reached at time m. But eventually, to compute what I am after, I need to integrate over all the possible values of y. y I mean, y can be 10, can be 100, can be uh, 0.3. So in other words, you would have another configuration, right, which would be this one, for instance. Oh, sorry, this, this one doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. But, uh, Say something like that. And then here I would need something, uh, whatever. OK, so then I would have another values of y. So I need to integrate over all these possible values. OK, so what is equivalent here is when you really integrate this over y. OK, so the integral, is that OK? Is it fine? OK, so now we have this result, but uh, we actually have much more because we know that this guy is just given by the Sparandersen theorem. So it's fairly explicit, not only explicit, but completely universal. So it does not depend on anything. So that means that this probability to reach, I mean, the, 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 to compute, if you want, the, the, the distribution of the, the, the maximum, the time at which the maximum is which, now you can just use par Anderson. So that tells you that this will be just 1 over 2 to the power 2m, 2m choose m. And then I will have, uh, so this is n minus m, so 2 to the power n minus m. And you will have n minus m, n minus m. OK, so you can just rewrite it eventually as it's a beautiful, beautiful formula. And again, which is completely universal. Does not depend on P of n, on the P of eta. Now, 
you can ask what, what's happening in the large end limit. And uh, if you look at, uh, okay, I will not probably, uh, should I? No, I don't, I don't, uh, I will not do it in details, but you can have, you can then use stealing formulas to look at the large end limit of this formula. Uh, and then what you, what you find is that, okay, so if you now look at the limit n goes to infinity, m goes to infinity, keeping the ratio x m over n fixed. Okay, so that's the most natural limit that you can do when you look at the, at the time and the large time limit, right? So in the time direction, m has, has to scale like n. Then what you find is that this guy actually uh, goes to some function f of uh, x, which is m over n. And this function f, maybe you have seen it, is a very, very famous, famous function. OK, so this is just this 1 over pi, square root of x, 1 minus x. And this is called the Axine law. And this was discovered by Levy in the 50s. And this is called the Axine law. Levy's law, Levy's Axine law. No, 50 is much, much, much before that, actually. So is it, is it clear, or I was a bit fast at the end? Yes? Yeah, the same, symmetric and continuous. Okay. So here I'm working with that, right? So uh, that's true also for Levy flights. OK, so you don't, I mean, it's uh, universal means, uh, yeah. Uh, what I want to, to emphasize is the fact that this is valid for uh, sigma finite or sigma infinite. Okay. So if you plot this function, uh, it's actually quite interesting, but uh, if, if you plot this function, you will see that, uh, well, of course, it's positive. And uh, it has these kind of things, yeah. So it's, it is diverging uh, in 0 and 1. So that means that uh, with high probability, you will reach the maximum either at 0 or at 1. And what does it mean? Well, it means that a typical trajectory, so it actually means something rather deep for the Brownian motion, is that, in fact, when you look at the, so what, I mean, why, why are there, so that means that you, it's, it's much more likely to reach the maximum close to 0 or close to 1. And now this has to do with the, the stiffness, if you want, of, of the Brownian motion, if you want to see, to see it as a polymer, uh, is that a typical trajectory, in fact, uh, is drifting in the sense that uh, of a random walk will be either something like this Right, so you would just do something like that. Okay, and then that means that the maximum will be reached very close to the origin when you started. Or it will drift on the other way. Okay, so that's actually, these are actually the typical uh, trajectories. Uh, when you think about the random walk, uh, in fact, most of the trajectories, in fact, look like that. OK, so that means that here, OK, I just m is typically over order 0, and m is typically over order n. Yeah? Does the probability to go back to 0 is still almost surely? Yeah, yeah, it's still almost surely. But OK, these are, these are two different kind of, 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 of objects, right? I mean, there is one probability to come back to the origin, which indeed uh, will, will happen at very large time. This, is, this, this indeed will happen. But typically, if you look at a given time n, uh, that's actually what, what, what will happen. Eventually, this kind of guy will somehow probably uh, come back to the origin. But it will come back. I mean, it, it can come back. But then if it come back, then again, it will just drift away. Uh, yeah. And it's, it, it, it has also to, to do with the fact that this distribution between the zeros actually are, have a very parallel tail. I mean, so it's 1 over t to the power of 3 by 2. So these are actually uh, extremely, extremely uh, flat, I mean, uh, extremely flat tails, right? So typically that will be extremely large.
Okay, so this is very nice result, I think. Uh, you see, I mean, how we can get this uh, uh, this this result using the, the what we had what what we have shown before uh, for the. Um, for the, I mean, we, we could use actually this par Andersen formula. Uh, yeah, I didn't write it, but of course I used I used this par Andersen formula when I uh, used that Q or not Q zero of n is, is simply that. Is it okay? So that more or less closes what I wanted to say about the extreme statistics of uh, random walks and Ryanian motions. I guess we will come back to this uh, random walks a bit later at the end of the lectures when we will look at the records, and I will show you how this, in fact, more or less the same tools, uh, survival probabilities, uh, and, uh, and also um, these par Andersen uh, formulas are quite useful to study the records. But before going to the records, I just wanted to show you another example of uh, extreme value statistics for strongly correlated variables. And, uh, Okay, so I, I, I thought it was uh, it could be a good idea to show you a little bit about uh, what kind of interesting questions one has or there are uh, in the context of random matrix theory. So as I said, I will not enter too much into the details of RMT. I will give you some background just to understand what is going on. And uh, I will discuss uh, some applications of essentially the largest eigenvalues of uh, random matrices, okay? Is that fine? No questions about, about this? Okay, so let's move on to that, uh, to that subject. Okay, so let's, let's go to, uh, so that's another, again, I mean, the, 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 the the logic, uh, the rationale behind the, the, the organization of the lectures here is that uh, we have seen the extremes of IID quite in detail. Then I showed you the extreme value questions for strongly correlated case. Uh, one example was this uh, random walk. And I showed you how essentially this is intimately related to this uh, survival probabilities and first passage problems. And now I want to discuss another examples. So it's basically another example of uh, extremes for um, strongly correlated variables. And that will be the case of uh, random matrices. And in particular, the kind of questions that I have in mind is to show you that uh, okay, when you look at these random matrices, uh, it turns out that uh, in many cases, the, the properties of the largest eigenvalues or the largest module or the, or the eigenvalues of the, with the largest uh, modulus uh, are actually uh, quite important, uh, random matrices. And that means uh, I will discuss uh, largest eigenvalue statistics somehow. So I will actually start with an example, which I found uh, quite nice, uh, which I hope will give you the, a bit the motivation as to why what, what should, one should uh, look at this. Okay, so let's start with some uh, introduction and motivations. So the example actually is taken from a very nice, a very nice paper uh, from the 70s by uh, Robert May, that's a nice paper from, uh, was published in Nature in 1972. It has a huge number of citations, uh, several, several thousands. Uh, so May was actually an ecologist, um, quite famous one, and uh, he's still alive, I think. And um, so he was studying this kind of, he had some model, he was studying some uh, ecology, I mean, uh, model related to, 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 to ecology, and what he, he was looking at the, 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 this, the following system. So he was considering an ecological system where you have, say, n different species. Uh, um, let's, at the moment, uh, let's suppose that they are without interactions. So, okay, 
let's let's just uh, announce it this way. So you have some end species which 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 are living in some uh, given ecological environment, and they are described uh, at and they are at equilibrium, whatever it means, dynamic equilibrium uh, at some uh, density uh, rho i star. Okay, so. The, 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 it's a very simple model uh, where you have this uh, n species uh, and uh, he's saying, okay, let's look at the case where they are just uh, at static, I mean, dynamic equilibrium, uh, which, uh, which is such that uh, at equilibrium they have a density rho i star. And what it means is that, and, and here we want to, to study the case where uh, without interactions, okay, so we suppose that, suppose for, for a while that that these species are just non-interacting. And uh, is, let's assume that in the absence of interactions, uh, these species are just uh, uh, in an equilibrium which is stable. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, it means that essentially if you, if you perturb your system, so if you define say this kind of variable like psi of t, uh, which would be the density at time t minus uh, the density at equilibrium, then essentially if you write uh, the equation uh, uh, of motion for this, for this i, well, then they will slowly, so if you slightly perturb it away from their uh, equilibrium value, then they will gently uh, relax uh, to their uh, equilibrium equilibrium state. Okay, so that's that's the idea. Okay, so and I suppose for simplicity that the time scale here, over which uh, they all these species relax to their initial value, is the same for all of them, and it's one. Okay, so I just set it equal to one. So it's a very simple and boring problem. Uh, now, what May asked. Uh, he wanted to ask, now, suppose that I switch on the interactions uh, with, between these, uh, these species, uh, under which uh, condition will this equilibrium, this global equilibrium, will remain stable? So what he proposed to do uh, is just to, to, to look at uh, what happens, what happens uh, when, if you switch on interaction. Okay, so you switch on interaction between these, uh, these, the, these two, the, these different species under the following case, I mean, in this form, Okay, that's, that's the way he introduced this model. So you have a matrix that couples now all these different species. Okay? And this is, of course, the dynamics that you have for all i between 1 and n. Okay? So this represents the interactions. It is, this, this is somehow the, the simplest interaction that you can imagine between these different species. So alpha is basically the, the strength of interactions, okay? And then you have some matrix uh, that uh, models or characterizes the, uh, the, the interactions between, between these guys, okay? So now the question that he asked uh, is, is, was, was the following, is, is basically uh, what is the probability? So he asked the, this, this question. So suppose that I have now, the system is quite complex, okay? Uh, that means that n is very large, and uh, the, the true interactions between the different species are extremely uh, diverse and complicated to characterize in details. So let's assume that gij is a random matrix. Okay? Let's assume that these gij are just random, uh, random numbers uh, that take into account the values, the, the, the diversity uh, of the interactions. Okay? So for so such a complex system, Uh, GIJ uh, can be is, is random variable is random. Take Gaussian random numbers if you want. And to simplify a little bit the analysis, he assumed also that the interactions are symmetric. So XI uh, interacts uh, on XJ in the same way as XJ interacts on XI. One can discuss this kind of approximation. I, I'm not pretending to make um, a very precise model of. Uh, of ecology, I'm just trying to show you that uh, um, how this 
extreme value questions naturally arises in some simple model. Okay. So you assume that the gij is real because these are interactions uh, and uh, they are just symmetric. And then he asked the question is, uh, OK, uh, if I do that, so without interactions, you see, uh, the system was stable. And the question that he asked is, if I, when, I, when I tune the interaction, what is the probability that the system remains stable? That's a quite reasonable question, right? And, and, and natural that the system remains stable. So how do I s study this problem? So again, this was this, uh, this question raised by May. Many people after, after him actually uh, studied similar type of questions. So how do I, I analyze this? Well, it's not that complicated. I mean, I just need to, to analyze the, uh, the linear stability of the system, which is, by the way, already linear. So linear stability analysis tells me that I need to know something about the eigenvalues of these guys. Okay, so I will diagonalize this, uh, this matrix. Okay, let's, let's be a bit more uh, precise here. So how do, how do I, uh, I analyze this? Um, so I have a linear stability criterion. And that tells me, essentially, that I can rewrite, if you want this. So x now is a vector, which encodes this x1, x2, xn. So I just use a matrix notation, if you want. And I get uh, that this is uh, alpha j minus the identity on n uh, times x. That's fine, so I just rewrote this linear system like this. And now let me introduce the eigenvalues of this matrix J, okay? So I will introduce as lambda one, lambda two, lambda n. Uh, the eigenvalue of, of, uh, of J. Okay, so J is a symmetric matrix, real symmetric matrix, so all these lambda i's are real, okay? No what? Yeah, no, it's yeah, yeah. You have to remember that xi is actually the distance with respect to the to the to the rho i star. Okay, so it's it actually it's uh, yeah. You should remember that uh, xi is the distance. Yeah, is rho i minus rho i star. Okay, so it's rho i of t. Okay, no, that's right. So that means that it, in the absence of, of interactions again. Everyone will gently relax to their, uh, if I slightly perturb the system, then the system will gently relax to its equilibrium, equilibrium states. Okay, so here you see, I mean, they are all real. Okay, I chose, I mean, they are like this because, again, J is a real symmetric matrix, okay? So its eigenvalues are, uh, are all real. So now, what does this, the stability criterion reads? I mean, it's pretty simple, right? So the, the system is stable uh, if and only if the eigenvalues of this matrix are all negative. Right? That means if alpha of lambda i minus 1 is strictly negative. OK? And this has to be true for all i. And this is just such that lambda i is smaller than 1 over alpha for all i. So that means that, uh, in other words, I want that if I look at the largest eigenvalues of this, of this set, I need to have, so if I define lambda max, so here comes my extreme observable, lambda i. Now this condition is just, equivalent to say that lambda max is smaller than 1 over alpha. OK? 
So now I have a partial answer to this question. Well, this probability, I could recast it on a question related to the eigenvalues of some random matrix, which is that this probability uh, is actually, so uh, let me call this probability P stable. Of course, it will depend on, on alpha. When alpha equals 0, this probability is just 1. And P stable is just the probability that lambda max is smaller than 1 over alpha. OK? So you see that this question here, this question of stability, boils down to say something about the statistics of the largest eigenvalue of these random matrices. Okay. Now, OK. May didn't know so much about, uh, about random matrices, but he was a very clever guy. And uh, <clears throat> so you see, I mean, this is already uh, the indication that uh, random matrix theory can help to understand this question. Now, what did May observe? I mean, he was doing uh, some uh, numerics, in fact. Uh, and yes. Uh, okay, so you are agree with that? Ah, this is this question that, that you're asking. Okay, so, okay, sorry, dx. Okay, so uh, if I suppose that I, I have the eigenvalues of j, so I will essentially diagonalize this. Uh, so I will write this, uh, this equation essentially in the eigenbasis of this random matrix, okay? And that means that now, for each of the uh, eigenvectors, somehow, I will have an equation uh, which essentially tells me that if alpha lambda i minus 1 is positive, then, so you see, I mean, the solution to this, to this, to this linear system is just an exponential, OK? So I need that all the, uh, the exponential are decaying. Because if, the, if I have a posit some positive eigenvalue here, then that means that there will be some eigenmode that actually diverges uh, exponentially. Is that okay? Yeah, G is symmetric. Yeah, so that's why I said yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, here J is, is symmetric. So indeed, I mean, I, I can diagonalize it, and I know that all the eigenvalues will be real. So there will not be any oscillating parts. So they are all real. And that means that the system is stable uh, if and only if all the, de all the, the eigenmodes will actually uh, decay exponentially, OK? If there is one mode that does not satisfy that, then that means that I will have one of the eigenmodes that actually diverge, uh, diverges exponentially. And of course, the system will not be stable. Is that clear? <clears throat> OK. So. So what, what, what May observed is that, so he was just uh, plotting. I mean, he was just uh, doing some numerics. And uh, what May observed is something which is quite nice. So under some assumptions, OK, that I will. Uh, so what, what did May really do? Uh, May chose uh, um, this JIJ not in a, in, a, in, in a random way. So if you want to have a, a, a nice large end limit, uh, you need that this, uh, so it shows the, the, J, the JIJ, so we will see this a, a little bit uh, later, uh, as uh, Gaussian uh, random variables. And that's the simplest model that you can think of, uh, which were centered. So JIJ is zero. And then, if you want to have a, a well-defined large end limit, we will see that uh, later on. But you need to have the variance. You need to choose the variance as to be of order 1 over n. It's clear that uh, if here, I mean, you see easily, I mean, there is, there is a number, a very large number of terms here. So if you want to have, um, you want to have this of order 1, OK? And uh, the central limit theorem uh, tells you that uh, basically, uh, this will be of order square root of n times the variance of that. So square root of n times 1 over square root of n. So that means that you choose this j square of order 1 over n. 
You want to have this simply over the one. Otherwise, of course, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, that, that's, that's another way, that, that, that would be another way to see it. So I could actually put a one over square root of n here, such that, okay, one over square root of n, and then gij would be, would be okay, and then by central limit theorem, one over square root of n times the sum of iid random variables is indeed finite. Okay, so that's, that's the idea, yeah. So that's the, the, the natural uh, limit that you, have, that, that you have to take. And uh, what he observed is that if you, basically, if you, uh, plot this distribution uh, as a function of alpha, uh, or say as a function of 1 over alpha, which I will call w in the following. So what he said is that, well, you see, I mean, uh, again, if alpha is very small, that means 1 over alpha are very large, uh, you expect that the system will be, with a high probability, will be stable, okay? Because that means that if alpha is stable, if alpha is zero strictly, then we know that the system is stable. Okay, so that means that this probability, of course, is bounded by one. So if you are very large, uh, then you would expect that it is simply one. And on the other hand, if alpha is very big, well, you would expect, or you could expect, that uh, if the, the interactions are extremely strong, and given that they are completely random. Uh, then it's with a high probability they will completely destroy the stability of the system. So when alpha is very large, that means one over alpha goes to zero, you expect this probability to be essentially zero. Then what he was observing actually in his simulations is that there is actually a quite sharp transition. So he said he was looking at, he was saying that there, there is a critical value, WC, uh, such that in the large end limit, uh, you, really observe, you really observe something like this. There is a true transition in this model. Now, of course, so this is the large end limit. And, uh, okay. When n is finite, of course, you would expect some finite size effects, and these finite size effects will smooth, smoothen out a little bit this, uh, this transition. So that would give instead something like that. Okay, so that will be for uh, finite n, say 10. Okay, so you have here a transition. This WC, we will see, I mean, we, we will be able to compute it later on. Uh, WC, uh, it's not. It should be actually one over square root of two. You will see why in a minute. I mean, maybe in a minute. So, so you have two regions, okay? So you have a region. So we, what, what, what is quite, quite, quite remarkable, you see, is that there is really uh, a transition such that if alpha is, uh, say, larger than WC, then your system is unstable with probability one, or, unsta or stable with probability zero. So you have a phase which is unstable. And here you have another phase, which is actually a stable phase. Okay. And this transition actually has been uh, observed uh, in many other, uh, many other systems. This transition is called, sometimes called the Wigner-May transition. So May, for obvious reason, because he introduced the model, he saw it. Now Wigner, because this turns out to be, Wigner was one of the pioneering uh, researcher in the field of uh, random matrices, and you will see that this Oh, missing. This transition is really related to, uh, to, to, uh, to random matrix theory and in particular to the Wigner semi circle. Yeah? And uh, how can you choose uh, alpha in the system? Okay, this I don't know. I mean, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, you can at least do it in numerics. I mean, it's, it's easy to do. Uh, now, uh, in a real system, I don't know. I mean, there, I guess there are many, many different systems to encourage this type of, this type of, of interactions. I don't know. Uh, I let you uh, imagine what kind of setup. <laughs> okay, there are, in, in, depending on the system that you have, I mean, you can do it. You can do it for, for sometimes, I mean, by increasing temperature or decreasing temperature, or uh, I don't know, you can, I mean, if you have different species, for instance, uh, uh, people, I mean, people, I don't know, they are, for instance, in some cases, they uh, force the, 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 I don't know, the species they have to, to look for, uh, 
food, for instance, and that increases the, the interaction between them because they want to cooperate. There are many different ways to do that. But again, I mean, uh, keep in mind that this is a toy model, right? I'm not yeah, yeah, yeah. pretending to uh, describe any concrete experiments. I really want to show you that these questions actually arise in simple models where uh, you can try to say something quantitative. OK? Yes? Uh, I didn't why the graph is like that. Why the graph is like that? No, that's normal, actually. I mean, uh, it is. <laughs> you mean, well, I mean, uh, what, what do you mean counterintuitive? I mean, what do you mean exactly? Uh, alpha grows. Yeah. One over alpha grows yes. It should be more difficult. Yeah, so the. Well, uh, no, I think it goes in the. No, this is intuitive, I suppose. Yes. Yes. Okay. So one of one of the alpha increases. Okay. So this probability is one. The probability that lambda max is less than infinity mm -hmm. is one. Okay. And so that's what I show here. Okay. One over alpha. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Is that fine? Mm -hmm. I think this is intuitive. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. What is non-intuitive is that there is a threshold, but uh, apart from that, the two limits. Is that clear? OK, fine. OK, so there are many questions, actually, that, that, that one can ask. Uh, and I will try, uh, we will try to answer some of the questions uh, that, that, uh, that, that are there. I mean, one question, which I think, uh, at least for statistical physicists, uh, is, 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 is interesting, uh, is that uh, is there any, OK, it's a dynamical system here, and I'm looking at some probability associated to that. One natural question is to to know whether there is a thermodynamic uh, uh, interpretation of this, of this phase transition. Does it have a thermodynamic interpretation? And if it's so, what is the order of this transition? So that's one question that we will answer here. And it turns out that it, this transition is quite peculiar. In nature, we know many systems that exhibit uh, one, I mean, first order or second order phase transition. It turns out that this transition is a third order phase transition. And so we will see how it. Uh, how it shows up and how it can really be uh, studied in detail using the RMT techniques, the techniques of random matrix theory. Again, I will not enter into the details, but I you will really see that uh, the analysis of this, of this transition um, is deeply related to, uh, to extreme value questions that, that I, I will now uh, try to, to study. And in particular, uh, uh, so now at some point, now I just want to give you a little bit of background on, on RMT, at least the minimal things that uh, you would, okay, that you're supposed to know to really uh, uh, address this question. So let me just define now, let me be a little bit more uh, specific. And uh, and just go to some backgrounds on RMT, right? So, but very basic. So the basic model that we are looking at will be the model that May is studying, right? So we have R, M, T. I will usually use this acronym. So the basic model that, uh, that, that, that I want to consider here uh, is really the, well, I can actually go to this, uh, to this uh, same notation as, uh, as this guy. So I have G. So which is a matrix, uh, and it is uh, typically of that form, right? So I have a matrix J. Uh, let's just uh, have it like this. So it will J11, uh, J1, J12, uh, J1N. It, it has to be symmetric. So it's, here is just J12 again. Uh, and here I would get J1N, the same as this one. And here I would get this J of NN. OK, so this is my matrix. It has to be symmetric. So it's already there. So gij is equal to g of ji. Very nice. And, uh, and they are real. Okay. 
And now I'm constructing, I'm constructing sorry, the, the a sort of probability. I, I need to, to give some probability measure on this, on this uh, matrix ensembles. So I will do it in a rather simple way. And I will do it in such a way that I choose all these random numbers as being Gaussians and independently uh, one from the others. Okay? So that means that this, the, the, the P of J will be up to some prefactor, uh, will be simply a product of Gaussians. Okay? So I will write it in this way. So it will be a product of a I and J of exponential minus J, J, I, J, I, J square. And actually, I need uh, to have uh, the variance to be uh, to be like, like like that I said. So I will choose it to be one minus n over two j i j square. Okay. So this n here is just because of that. Right? Well, the variance to be about a one over n. Otherwise, it's a it's a global rescaling. I mean, which is unimportant. But uh, I prefer to have it this way. Now you see that this guy. Uh, you can still write it in a different way. I mean, the product of Gauss. So this is a natural measure that you, that, that you have, right? I mean, you just take Gaussian random numbers, and you put them in your matrix. And then you will look at the, the eigenvalues of it. Now, let's just rewrite this a little bit. This product of exponential, I can just write it as the, the exponential of the sum. So that will be exponential of minus n over 2, sum over ij, jij squared. OK, you like it? So now let me manipulate it uh, a little bit. I want to rewrite this in a nicer way. So now I want to use the fact that jij is equal to jgi. OK, so that means that the p of j that I have, I can, again, write it like this. So it's exponential of minus n over 2. And I would have, I, I can write it this way, right? I have G I J, J G I. Okay, I didn't do anything. I just used the fact that the matrix is symmetric. And now, this, uh, you see, uh, you can just write it like this. So it's sum over I. All the sums are going from one to n. I just write, don't write them explicitly because I'm too lazy. But yeah, exactly. So this is just j square i i. And this is just the trace of j square. So we like that. Why? Uh, so that means that this is just 1 over zn exponential of minus n over 2 trace of j square. So we like this because uh, it, now it has uh, a nice uh, invariant, invariance property, and I didn't have time to really make a full, uh, uh, to give you a full historical background of RMT, but RMT was initially introduced in the context of nuclear physics. Yeah? Okay, so here you see, I mean, I have uh, a product of two, I can see as, a, as the product of two matrix, A, I, J. So when you have this, you sum over j. Uh, this is, uh, by definition, this is a, b, uh, i, k. And you apply this formula to uh, a equal b equal j, and i equal to k. Then, yes. So the reason why uh, I want to have <coughs> You will see that if you, OK, there are two reasons. Uh, the first one is that you will see in a minute, or maybe tomorrow, uh, that if you look, uh, if, you, if you take this, uh, the, the measure like that, then typically, uh, if you, I will be interested in the, the eigenvalues of this matrix. And what happens when you choose this, uh, this, this, this scaling here, that means if I choose the variance to be of order 1 over n, it turns out that the typical value of the, of the eigenvalues are of order 1 in the limit when n goes to infinity. Okay, so if you choose your things like that, if you take n very large, 10,000, if you look at the eigenvalues, then all the eigenvalues typically will be of order 1. And they will converge to something finite when n goes to infinity. If I don't do that, 
So if I, I guess you would prefer to take something of order one, okay? Then if you do that, what will happen is that your eigenvalues are of order square root of n. So it's just that, it's just a simple rescaling, and that's somehow a little bit more comfortable to work uh, with uh, quantities which eventually are of order one. Now in May's model, uh, in May's model, that, that, that the reason is that, again, you want to have uh, an interaction form which is also typically of order one when n goes to infinity. Otherwise, the strength of the interaction would be uh, too much too much too strong, and the, the, the interactions will would always always win in that case. Okay, so it's just maybe you will see that. Uh, yeah, probably t today I will not have time to show that, but uh, the eigenvalues are of order one here. That clear? Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, uh, that's true. I, I could, I could uh, just so. Absolutely. Yeah, I could just. Uh, uh, what you are saying is that. Uh, well, in other words, here uh, I just want to. It's it's sort of more convenient uh, to write it in this way, uh, because like this. Uh, like this, I can see this, uh, this uh, I mean, nicely, I can see this, uh, this trace of J square. But you are right, I mean, somehow I would not need to sum over it, over it, yeah. Yeah, but probably if I do the minor or equal, then I can do Yeah, okay, so the, that means that in that case, if you do that, then you, you have, you, you, the, the point is that in that case, if you do what you want to do, then you need to take uh, random variables which are not exactly the same. So the, the diagonal values will have uh, variance one over n, and the, and the non-diagonal ones will have a variance which is double or half, yeah. okay? So this is just a matter of choice, I mean, but, but that's true. Uh, I, want, I want to have something which eventually read like this. Depending on how you define here your random numbers, then you will need to, cho to choose them either completely identical or you will have to single, I mean, to, to, to differentiate between the diagonal and the non-diagonal non terms. Yeah, right. yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay, it's, it's a bit, uh, okay, considered it as a bit technical, that's why I didn't enter into this point, but, but, but you are definitely right. Okay, so why is it interesting? I mean, because, as I said, I mean, people in the, in the early days uh, of random matrix theory, uh, people were uh, modeling uh, heavy uh, nuclei, so, uh, so in, in nuclear physics, they were modeling the Hamiltonian of, 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 this, of these nuclei by these random matrix theories, saying that basically instead of considering a complicated Schrodinger Hamiltonian, why not consider just a, a simple uh, random matrix, right? I mean, because the interactions between all the components of a heavy nuclei is so complicated. So let's try to assume that it is just uh, random. And then at that time, they were, of course, driven by some uh, symmetry reason. Uh, and they re easily, I mean, quickly realized that you cannot choose any types of random matrix theory. They need to be invariant under some kind of transformation. And then here, this is one of these models which is invariant under rotation. Indeed, uh, if, you, uh, if you define uh, uh, a new matrix, J prime, which is obtained uh, from J uh, by simple uh, change of, of basis, so you just do this, uh, uh, this uh, conjugation, where O is uh, orthogonal matrix, OK? Uh, then it's easy to see that uh, you can compute easily the trace of j prime square. Okay, so trace of j prime square is just trace of, so let's do it. So it's O, G, O dagger, O, G, O dagger. Now O dagger O is just identity. So this is just the trace of O, J square, O dagger. And then the trace is cyclic, so I can just put this O dagger here. And O dagger O is, ident is identity, so this is obviously equal to trace of J square. Right? So that means that if you take two matrices which are equivalent up to this uh, uh, orthogonal uh, rotation, if you want, this orthogonal transformation, then basically they have the same weight. Okay? So this defines. Uh, some given weights to each uh, class of equivalence, if you want, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this thing. Okay, so uh, so that means that these two guys 
Eventually, what it means is that this is p of j prime is equal to p of j. Okay, and that's actually uh, quite important. I mean, that was quite important uh, in the early days of RNT, and this is one of the most uh, the, the ensemble that I am describing here is the most uh, well known. Is certainly one of the well, I mean, yeah, uh, most emblematic ensemble, and this is called under the name of the Gaussian. Gaussian, you have understood why? Because J are Gaussian. Orthogonal, now I think you have understand also because uh, the probability measure is invariant under orthogonal transformations. Ensemble. Okay, so this is GOE. So this equation Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then. Uh, then I will just end up uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, with the following thing is that uh, now because of this uh, invariance property, it turns out that if you look at uh, this uh, random uh, random matrix, so one way to characterize the, this random matrix is to uh, give it uh, or give you the or describe the eigen, its eigenvalues on the one hand and its eigenvectors on the other hand. Now, because of this, uh, because of this property here, it turns out that this, for this or such Gaussian random matrices, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are completely independent. Okay. And this is true for any n. I mean, this is not an asymptotic uh, uh, result. This is true for any value of n. And so that makes sense then to study only the, the eigenvalues of such uh, random matrices. And uh, so if I define uh, lambda 1, lambda n, uh, the n eigenvalues. So these are random variables, right? Because you see that if you take uh, one matrix of this ensemble and then another one, and if you look at the eigenvalues, obviously they will be different. Okay. Now the remarkable uh, property is that for such models, uh, it is actually possible to write explicitly the joint law of these uh, random uh, eigenvalues. Okay. And that was. Uh, that was done uh, essentially by by Wigner himself, and it reads like that. So there is uh, some prefactor here. There is a first term which is a bit uh, trivial somehow. Which really comes from the fact that uh, these are Gaussian, simple, simple Gaussian random variables, so this lambda i square really comes from this trace of j square. And now there is a non-trivial part which comes from the fact somehow uh, from the, the, the integration over the, 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 unit, the orthogonal group. So you, when you, you perform the integral over the, the, uh, the matrix, so, so, so the, the eigenvectors, and there is a non-trivial term that comes out of, of that. Okay, so that's actually quite nice because again, this is just uh, now the equivalent of, I mean, this is simple, this would be simple independent uh, Gaussians, so that would be a simple case of IID, as we have discussed uh, in the earlier lectures. But now you have a non-trivial non interaction term. Okay, so this can be as a Jacobian, this can, this can be viewed as a Jacobian. Uh, uh, this is a van der Mond determinant, and this is really the interaction. So that tells you that these uh, eigenvalues are actually extremely strongly correlated. There are various ways to understand that, but the most quantitative way is to do that. Now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's uh, really, I mean, it's, uh, I would need half an hour to derive it. Yes. And yeah, the trace will be that. But then, of course, you have to, you have a measure in, in front. You have a Jacobian, right? You have a Jacobian that uh, initially you are essentially here. Well, basically, this, you can just see it as a Jacobian, right? This is mathematically, this, this, comes, this comes out as a Jacobian, right? Yeah. Uh, lambda i's are the eigenvalues of j squared. 
lambda i are the eigenvalues of j. Of j. j. Yes, of j. Yeah. So just to answer your question again, I mean, you, indeed, initially this p of j, you see, I mean, so you have to, to essentially to here the, the measure is is in is in as a function of the the matrix elements, and you want to reparameterize this measure in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So there will be a Jacobian between in, within this transformation, and that's what is non-trivial, and and this produces this 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 term here. Okay. Now it turns out that uh, there are many other interesting models that people uh, have studied, which are sort of a variant of these guys. So maybe I will just uh, just mention it here briefly before we before I, I stop. Uh, you can actually introduce here a parameter beta. And beta is strictly positive. And you have a nice, uh, a nice uh, collections of models. And uh, we have seen beta equal 1. So beta equal 1 is the GOE. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So now I come to the description. I just described up to now the, the beta equal 1 ensemble. And there is another model uh, which is, corresponds to beta equal 2, and which is known under the name of Gaussian unitary ensemble. So this is a model which you, you see here we have dealt with matrices which were real symmetric. So you could also work with uh, Hermitian uh, matrices. Hermitian matrices would also have real eigenvalues. So this is this ensemble, the GUE. Gaussian unitary ensemble because they would be uh, the measure is invariant under this kind of transformation, but where O actually becomes belongs to the unitary group, so it's U U dagger. And there is another group, okay, which probably is, is always a bit frightening, and I will not mention too much. Uh, this is the beta equal four, and which is called the Gaussian symplectic ensemble. So now here we have real symmetric. Here we have. Uh, Hermitian, so we put Gaussian numbers, but now you could also put quaternions if you like it, if you really like it. Um, and then uh, you will end up uh, in this uh, fourth model, beta equal 4. Now, more recently, people realized that there were also construction, very nice construction, uh, for any beta. Uh, this was done by Edelman and Dumitriou in the, in the 2000. Um, where you can actually have some three diagonal uh, ensembles for any beta. I will not comment too much on that. But so later on, uh, in, the in the next lecture, I will show you how uh, one can understand this probability measure in terms of statistical mechanics of interacting particles. And namely, I will show you that uh, there is a nice uh, Coulomb, Coulomb uh, type of uh, model behind this, this, uh, this guy here. And then I will derive some basic, uh, basic stuff and uh, Essentially, then arriving at some uh, properties of the largest eigenvalues, which we are after. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.